Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar with the title Autonomy and Sovereignty Conflict, Insights from Catalonia and Perspectives from Post-Brexit Scotland and Northern Ireland. My name is Mark Rökler and I'm the head of the Center for Autonomy Experience and uh, our center is newly founded, so we are only one year old and we are part of Europe Research. And we are dealing mainly with the topics autonomy and minority protections at all. This webinar today is the first edition of our annual, annual webinar series called uh, Discussing World Autonomies, which we are co-organizing with the uh, World Autonomies Project. And um, yes, from a South Tyrolean perspective, I think this webinar gives us the possibility to take the broader view and to learn more from other realities. And um, I think with Catalonia, with Northern Ireland and Scotland, there are no other cases right now which could be more topical. And uh, if you allow me just to mention some aspects in Scotland, um, we might have a second independence referendum. And uh, in Northern Ireland, of course, the impact of Brexit could be a game changer and is um, yeah, already changing some aspects of the protocol. And uh, in Catalonia, of course, there are several topical issues, such as the past elections. And uh, also, if you, if you read the news yesterday, for example, you came across the vote of the European, European Parliament regarding the immunity of Catalan MEPs. So um, I think we have a lot to talk about. And before I give the floor to our project partner and also the moderator of this webinar, Sergio Constantin, I would like to thank uh, our brilliant panelists. So Claire, Danny and Mark, thank you very much for your time and for accepting the invitation. Uh, we are really happy to have you here with us today. So thank you very much for that. And uh, secondly, I would also thank also the numerous participants of this webinar. Um, I know there is a flood of webinars going on right now, and I think we're all quite tired of not seeing each other in person. So I'm happy that uh, so many of you are following us today. So uh, that's all from my side, and I'm wishing you all a very fruitful webinar, and I wish you, wish us an interesting discussion. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Sergio. Thank you, Mark. And um, of course, first of all, many thanks to the, to the speakers uh, who agreed to, to join us today to, to have this conversation. I would very much like to be a conversation. And um, I think this is um, what I wanted to highlight that the, 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 the participants, the public, I think, has a major role in making this conversation. So please feel free to, and don't be shy, feel free to, to uh, uh, type your questions, send your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the webinar. My colleague Anakira Pirhofer, I think, already shared announcement there. So uh, before I'm starting with a, present, a brief presentation of our speakers, um, please allow me to say a few words about the project Autonomy Arrangements in the World, because this is webinar, as Mark mentioned, is a kind of joint enterprise of the center and this, this uh, project. Uh, the project uh, has mainly uh, two, uh, two main aims. Uh, the first one, the, the short term one, is to create um, as much as possible a comprehensive collection of uh, case studies of territorial and non-territorial autonomies from all over the world, including lesser known cases. And uh, the, the long term goal is to um, uh, facilitate a comparative analysis of uh, territorial arrangements to inform the design and the implementation of self-governance as a tool for accommodation of diversity and to provide a better understanding of theoretical and practical uh, developments in this field. Uh, this project is a, is a joint enterprise as well. Um, uh, it's it's um, uh, basically conducted by uh, several partner institutions. Uh, here in EURAC, uh, there are two uh, institutes involved, the Institute for Minority Rights and the Institute for Comparative uh, Federalism. Then we have the Center for the Study of Democracy at the Babes Boya University, the European Center for Minority Issues, and the Romanian Institute for Research on National Minorities. Uh, if you want to learn more about the project, uh, at the end of the webinar, my colleague Nakira will also share with you Again, in the in the question and answers uh, section, uh, some some additional information, website, uh, social media, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now uh, please allow me to briefly introduce the speakers. Um, I will start uh, with Mark Sonjom because um, uh, the first case we will uh, address today will be Catalonia. So Mark is a professor of political science at the Open University of Catalonia. He's also an adjunct professor at the Pompeu Fabra University, where he's a member of the political theory research group. 
Uh, formerly, Mark was an advisor uh, at the Self-Government Studies Institute in Catalonia and a visiting researcher at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and the Université Laval in Quebec, as well as a postdoctoral researcher at the Université du Québec à Montréal. I, I hope my French accent is decent enough. So. Um, the second speaker, our second speaker is uh, Claire Rice. Uh, she's a researcher at the Newcastle University, uh, working currently on a very interesting project called Performing Identities, Post-Brexit Northern Ireland and the Reshaping of the 21st Century Governance. Her current work primarily focuses on examining the interactions between Northern Ireland's multi-level governance structures, analyzing developments in the process of the UK's exit from the EU, and exploring the impact of Brexit on citizen experience and opinions in Northern Ireland. And uh, finally, Daniel Setra uh, is a research fellow um, at the Center on Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh. Interesting enough, Daniel is a Catalan as well. So we have uh, two Catalans today on the, on the panel. It'll be interesting to see whether they see this, themselves, the, the issues in Catalonia the same way or not. Um, Daniel's work uh, currently examines political dynamics in plurinational states with an emphasis on the ways in which political actors articulate competing views on the state, nation, and the territorial constitution. Last but not least, uh, Daniel is the winner of the 2021 Federal Scholar in Residence program at the Institute for Comparative Federalism here at URAG Research. So I really hope, in fact, we really hope all that uh, in some will be possible to travel uh, and to join us here for your research stay. And um, uh, yes, I think uh, without further delay, uh, I would now uh, open um, uh, the discussion. In fact, I will start, we will, uh, I propose to, to, stru uh, to structure the webinar in the following way. Uh, I will give the floor to each of the speaker for roughly 10 minutes to, to give us a kind of overview of the latest development the latest developments uh, in um, the three uh, case studies. And then we will open the discussion. And um, Mark, please, you have the floor. Tell us what's happening or what happens in Catalonia. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Sergio. Uh, thank you to this uh, project and to the URAC uh, Research Center for organizing this, this webinar. You are doing a great job. I really love your project. This is unique in, in the world. And I learned a lot uh, reading the, these uh, profiles you are publishing on, on autonomy examples in comparative politics uh, around the world. Um, all the nations uh, in the world and all the countries are now facing very, very difficult times uh, with this COVID-19 uh, crisis. And Catalonia is also uh, an example of that. Uh, we, have, we have been struggling, struggling now since last March as all the countries with this pandemic. But uh, sovereignty, uh, autonomy and self-determination are still a very, very, very uh, popular topic here, a very central topic in, in Catalan politics. And I, I will try to explain that in, in, in just uh, 10 minutes. So the first thing I, I wanted to say is that uh, we had a regional elections uh, uh, three weeks ago, and we could uh, we could uh, witness uh, how this this topic of self determination and independence and the debate around Catalan autonomy, more in general, are still structuring Catalan politics and are still uh, somehow organizing political alliances across the uh, Catalan political uh, spectrum. Um, if we go back in time, uh, rem remember when, when Catalonia was uh, on the news all over the world, uh, 2017, when uh, this uh, unilateral referendum on independence took place here in, in, in Catalonia, and then uh, the, the Spanish government reacted in a very, very aggressive way, uh, deployed a uh, law and order uh, counter-secessionist strategy, suspending Catalan autonomy, um, prosecuting Catalan political leaders and uh, jailing those that remained in Catalonia while the Catalan president and some regional ministers fled to Belgium and, and, and other countries. This was uh, a crucial moment, a critical juncture for in, in the Catalan, in the recent Catalan history. And this is still, this is still a very important moment uh, in Catalan politics. So, um, 
what happened four years ago uh, is still marking the 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 topics we are talking about uh, nowadays but many things many things change since then and i will try to explain that using some using some uh data from from cyber so so from from public service so let me let me share my my uh presentation i have just uh, a few slides to show uh to show you some some of these uh some of these data so uh as you probably know, Catalonia enjoys uh, enjoys a, a, um, a degree of autonomy within the within the Spanish uh, the Spanish territorial model, and this uh, Catalan autonomy had been has been working now since uh, since the beginning of the 80s, the late 70s, when democracy was uh, reestablished in uh, in Catalonia, and. Um, during a long period of time, and you can see here uh, the preferences of the Catalan, uh, the Catalan electorate regarding uh, territorial territorial models for Catalonia, being a region of Spain, status quo, meaning Catalonia being an autonomy as it is nowadays, uh, being a federal state within a, an imagined federal Spain, or being an independent country. Uh, the preferences of, of the Catalan electorate and, and most of the Catalans had been stable for uh, for many years until until a decade ago. Uh, the Catalan autonomy, uh, from my point of view, was a total success uh, in terms of uh, democratic transition, the Spanish transition to democracy, and deploying uh, Catalan government uh, Catalan autonomy, language protection, cultural protection, and some economic uh, economic development in Catalonia during many years in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, and also in the 2000s. But something happened. Something happened around 2010, and we don't have time. We don't have time now to analyze to analyze all these uh, all these data. But let me say that at some point. Um, around a decade, 15 years ago, something changed. Uh, Catalonia was asking for more autonomy and this autonomy could not be uh, de delivered within the current territorial uh, Spanish model, which is, which is uh, even more homogeneous than the Italian model uh, and is uh, basically a regionalized uh, uh, territorial territorial system in which autonomies enjoy uh, a high administrative degree of decentralization, but a very low level of uh, shared rule and uh, and uh, uh, sovereignty on uh, actual sovereignty on many on many issues. Uh, this crisis, this constitutional crisis in the 2000s, at the very beginning, was a crisis on the on the autonomy model, but as you probably know, as you probably know, uh, the the key actors here and the pro autonomy party Convergencia Unió at that time switch its uh, uh, its direction, its political ideology towards to uh, independence, and uh, in a very in a, in relatively a few time. Um, Catalan public opinion switch from being basically pro autonomy towards more uh, independence and and, uh, and and to some extent to self determination federalism uh, or or just independence uh, this support for independence has been has been stable uh, during the last during the last decade and uh, there was a there was a very a very fast change a very uh, um, uh, an important change in public opinion in 2010. And since then, uh, support for independence, according to the polls, has been around 45, uh, 45%. And whereas support for pro-unity uh, options in polls was lower in the past and has been mobilizing across time. And nowadays, what, what we see is uh, basically a division between those for and against independence, which are constantly in the polls around forty uh, percent, forty-five percent for, forty percent against. It depends on it depends on 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 the poll. Um, in terms of parliamentary support to 
for for independence. What we have seen now it's uh, support for independence uh, during the last uh, during the last um, uh, four elections, a majoritarian support for independence in the parliament. Uh, the those parties supporting uh, Catalan independence uh, have hold the majority in the Catalan parliament since since 2012. And this demand for uh, self-determination has been uh, has been articulated or has been uh, uh, um, 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 developed through different plans in each uh, in each mandate. So in 2012, uh, uh, there was this uh, government led by uh, President Artur Mas that organized a sort of non-binding consultation on independence when uh, the Spanish government rejected, uh, the, the Spanish parliament rejected uh, uh, allowing for a referendum on independence. Uh, in 2015, the regional elections were presented by pro-independence parties as a plebiscite on independence. Uh, this mandate on independence or on self-determination more in general was again rejected by uh, Spanish authorities. And finally, uh, in, 2000, in 2017, uh, took place this uh, unilateral referendum. And again, there were regional elections called from from the Spanish, the Spanish government after suspending Catalan autonomy and pro-independence parties won again uh, uh, the elections. And since 2017, we we have seen this uh, trial against uh, against the leaders of uh, the, the leaders, uh, the Catalan leaders that were in office in 2017. And as you know, uh, most of them were convicted to jail. They were convicted for sedition and other, and other very serious crimes. And also the president of the Catalan parliament at that time and uh, civil society leaders of the most important civil society, uh, the most uh, uh, relevant civil society organizations have been jailed uh, since then. Um, and as I said before, uh, the president and some regional ministers remain uh, abroad in order to, scare, to, to avoid this uh, detention. And we are today in, 2000, uh, in 2021, and we are, still, we are still facing this situation in which uh, in the recent elections, there was a majority, there was a majority uh, supporting uh, independence in the Catalan parliament. And this is still uh, uh, this is still rejected by the Spanish. Uh, this demand is still rejected by the Spanish government. Uh, uh, the, 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 now the socialist government uh, of uh, Pedro Sanchez promised some uh, dialogue when uh, Pedro Sanchez was uh, elected as a Spanish prime minister. But we are still in a situation in which uh, there are there are no negotiations on this topic. But there was. Three weeks ago, there was again a majority, a pro-independence majority in the Catalan parliament. My question is, is that are we facing an eternal, an eternal demand for uh, independence without any, without any possibility of uh, moving on and changing the political landscape? Well, yes and no. Uh, if we look closer to the recent results, things are more uh, complicated than, than we can, uh, as you can imagine. The Catalan parliament uh, is uh, very complex nowadays, uh, extremely fragmented. And as you can see on the left, uh, this uh, pro-independence majority is in fact a majority built up uh, by three uh, pro-independence forces, which are uh, leftist, center-right and extreme left, uh, ERC, Together for Catalonia and uh, Candidatura de Unidad Popular, and and these parties have uh, different positions on on the strategy on self determination and independence. And uh, the novelty, or uh, one of the most important elements here, is that in these recent elections, the leadership within the pro independence bloc, uh, as you can see in the left, is now uh, is now. Uh, is now uh, belongs now to the, to the ERC party, which used to be the second uh, pro-independence party. And the ERC party has a more uh, nowadays has a more gradualist or moderate approach uh, to independence. 
Uh, it's also a leftist party that is supporting Pedro Sanchez in uh, the Spanish parliament. So we can see here uh, change in terms of leadership within the pro-independence bloc that could, at some point, uh, could uh, provide or could open the door for uh, more negotiations or a, a negotiated solution with the Spanish government. Um, up to this date, what we have seen is that the Spanish government is not is not uh, is not uh, moving on this direction. Uh, we we don't see now a negotiation table on. Uh, uh, self-determination issues and so on. But ERC is still supporting this idea and we will see how the new Catalan government is formed uh, during the next during the next weeks. This is this is the most probable majority and probably we will see we'll see the formation of a new uh, pro-independence government in Catalonia, this time led by, by the ERC party. If we if we reorder the Catalan parties in a different way, if we re as you can see on the right, so the same results reordered in a different way. What we also see is that the Catalan government, uh, the Catalan parliament is nowadays leaning clearly to the left. So if we include the Socialist Party or, or if we reorder the parties according to, uh, uh, to uh, their, their ideology or according to uh, the left-right blocs, let's say, what we can see is that there is also an important leftist majority that, well, given the fact that we are in a situation of uh, crisis and probably the country will face uh, social and economic crisis, we also see uh, changes in terms of potential alliances uh, for uh, leftist policies. Um, although, as I said, uh, the dominant axis and the, domini the dominant cleavage nowadays in Catalan politics is still the cleavage you can see on the left. So the cleavage on independence with these three parties, uh, three parties supporting independence and the rest of the parliament, which are, which are against uh, independence. There is also a relevant, uh, let, let me, let me uh, uh, say a final comment. Uh, there is also a relevant element here, um, uh, which is this uh, purple part, the, the party you can see in purple. This party, uh, the Podemos, the Comuns, as, as they are called in Catalonia, this party is against independence, but in favor of a referendum on independence. So there is a there is a, a more than an absolute majority. There is a, there is a large majority in the Catalan Parliament for a, a Catalan self determination, a referendum on a sovereignty or on on autonomy, on independence, and we will see we will see if this is if this is uh, is it possible to uh, uh, achieve this uh, this objective. Um, I stop now sharing my sharing my screen. I will be more than happy to uh, answer your questions, your comments. Um, this introduction was just a, an initial speech to, uh, to motivate you to ask questions. So I will be here to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, for this quite comprehensive overview of the uh, situation developments in the in the last years in Catalonia. There are already some questions coming, which is a good sign. So, um, but now I would like to to move uh, on to to give the floor to to Claire. So um, to see what what happens after the post Brexit drama kicks in. I mean, I think there's every day some news coming out uh, regarding this infamous Northern Ireland Protocol. So, Claire. Tell us more, please. Thank you. No problem. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, yeah, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. There we go. Can you see it okay? Perfect. Okay. So um, first of all, I just want to say thank you um, for the invitation to speak today. And thank you to Mark and Sergio for such a warm welcome and introduction. Um, I will be talking about Northern Ireland um, in relation to Brexit and more specifically the withdrawal agreements protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. So I'm going to begin with a very brief overview of some of the key political and social dynamics that were at play in Northern Ireland during the Brexit process, just in order to establish some context for the analysis I'll go on to present then of what's happening currently here in Northern Ireland in relation to the protocol 
Um, and then I'll conclude by looking to some key future events that are both informing and being driven by the current developments. Um, Sergio, I may run over time, so if you can let me know when there's about a minute or so left, then that should keep us about right. Okay, so um, we all know that the Brexit negotiation process between the EU and the UK was anything but smooth. Um, in addition to this, Brexit politics within the UK were far from simple, and this was no less true in Northern Ireland's case. The referendum forced a binary choice here on staying in or leaving the European Union on a matter which entailed fundamental constitutional considerations. In broad term, unionist political parties campaigned to leave the European Union, whereas nationalist parties campaigned to remain. And the future of Northern Ireland in constitutional terms was pushed to the forefront of public discourse. In the wider context of Northern Ireland's history, the Brexit referendum wasn't simply a question of remaining in or leaving the EU. It was a question that fundamentally and potentially posed a threat to the Union, while simultaneously posing a threat to North-South integration on the island of Ireland and, to the road, and the road to Irish reunification. The polarising impact of Brexit was demonstrated over a succession of elections, some of which I've listed here, um, and the political institutions in Northern Ireland effectively collapsed as well in January 2017. I have to say that wasn't directly as a consequence of Brexit, but it certainly wasn't helped by the dynamics it introduced to the already unstable working relationship between the Democratic Unionist Party or the DUP and the Nationalist Party Sinn Féin. The first election after this saw the mobilisation of the nationalist vote for a number of reasons I'm happy to go into further in the Q&A um, if it's of interest. And then a general election after that which saw mobilisation of the unionist vote in response. The outcome was the complete erosion of the middle ground parties at the Westminster level, um, with the exception of one independent representative. Partly in response to this and the ongoing political inertia in Northern Ireland, subsequent elections then saw the centre ground alliance party gain seats and increase their vote share, um, as well as SDLP and DUP, with these votes uh, generally coming from the DUP and Sinn Féin, who were the two largest parties. Electoral pacts were seen to be formed around Brexit agendas in relation to the European Parliament election in 2019 and the second Westminster election then later that same year. Against this backdrop then, the DUP was also part of a confidence and supply arrangement with the Conservative Party in Westminster and a core element of which was the expectation of consultation during the Brexit negotiation process and support for the passage of Brexit votes um, in the House of Commons. So it was only following the breakdown of this arrangement that the path was cleared for a deal to be reached between the political parties within Northern Ireland uh, to return to the institutions, notably the new decade, new approach deal that was reached uh, in relation to this hardly mentioned Brexit. It established an executive subcommittee on Brexit, but this was disbanded in May 2020 at the height of the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic. And interestingly, actually, the first vote that the Assembly held after it got back into business passed unanimously, and it was a vote to withhold consent for the withdrawal agreement that had been reached between the EU and the UK. These dynamics, they merit a presentation in themselves, um, and I'm happy to talk further about those in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to look here at the protocol um, and what these interesting dynamics that I referred to in my previous slide reflect is that from very different perspectives, every political element in Northern Ireland was opposed to the protocol that is currently in place here. This has been known for a while now, but what wasn't known until very recently was the detail on how that protocol would actually function in practical terms uh, in relation to trade specifically and what the requirements would be on the businesses that would be tasked with operating it. That wasn't agreed until Christmas Eve of 2020, so just, just past there, um, which left businesses, ports and other key stakeholders with more, a little more than a week to get the appropriate infrastructure in place. The operation of the protocol was unsurprisingly with some problems initially in light of this as businesses were started their adjustment processes. And while these practical challenges are important in their own right, it was what they represented and continue to represent that has been most problematic. Trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland continues to face frictions, even while the grace periods are all still in effect. And Brexit, um, and by consequence, the protocol, therefore, is essentially the reason for these. For unionists in particular, this is uh, deeply concerning. After Prime Minister Boris Johnson stated in November 2019 that any requirements for customs paperwork should be, and I quote, put in the bin, 
uh, and therefore ignored to now have a situation where these very requirements are now in force is to put it quite bluntly the opposite of what was promised and seemingly the opposite of what the UK actually intended to achieve in terms of its arrangements with the European Union. Confusing narratives around the protocol have also not helped. Initial denial by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland of a hard border in the RC after the protocol came into force, as seen in the tweet that I have here at the bottom of my screen, soon gave way to an acknowledgement of the challenges it was giving rise to in Northern Ireland. Calls from within unionism for Article 16 to be invoked have been consistently rejected. And just to explain what that means in short, Article 16 is a safeguard mechanism that's built into the Northern Ireland Protocol, which uh, enables one side to be able to take steps should the protocol give rise to, and I quote again, serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist or to, or to diversion of trade. It also enables the other side to take appropriate rebalancing measures in response. Yet following the EU's incident where it almost invoked Article 16, and again, that's something I'm happy to discuss further in Q&A, um, this was in relation to the, the movement of vaccines across the, the island of Ireland. The UK's Prime Minister moved to threatening the use of it. Um, most recently, a unilateral proposal to alter the grace period arrangements has given rise to the EU, indicating the possible pursuit of legal action now against the UK for infringement of the protocol. And it's worth reminding ourselves that that isn't the first time that such a proposal has come forward. With all of this going on, Northern Ireland is, to put it bluntly, it is caught in the middle. Um, and unionists in particular are caught in a complex nexus between all of these various dynamics. These images on the screen are of some graffiti and, pub and messaging in public areas here in Northern Ireland that has appeared since the protocol came into force. They have contributed to staff being temporarily removed from border posts at ports in Belfast and Larn, and they make it unequivocally clear, clear that the protocol simply cannot continue in its current form and what the nature of at least some of the opposition to its presence is. This is a position that has also been advocated by unionist political parties, not least the Democratic Unionist Party, who have devised a plan specifically aimed at undermining the operation of the protocol. The broad consensus in Northern Ireland is that the protocol has problems. I think it's fair to say that there's nobody is disagreeing with that um, or that these problems need to be addressed. But for unionists in particular, the problem of the protocol, problems of the protocol are not just practical, but they are deeply symbolic also. So I'm going to conclude here by highlighting three things. The first is that the next election to the Northern Ireland Assembly is set to happen next year. The second is that under Article 18 of the protocol, there will also be a vote then in 2024 on the continued application of uh, aspects of the protocol, specifically Articles 5 to 10, which relate to trade. And the final is that uh, debate and conversation around Northern Ireland's future in terms of Irish reunification have now gained a momentum in the wake of Brexit and they're happening now almost in the expectation of a border poll or a unification referendum being imminent or at least much closer to becoming a reality than was the case before Brexit. All of these dynamics are shaping to greater and lesser degrees what is happening currently within politics in Northern Ireland. The first will likely act as a proxy vote on the second, which in turn will act as a proxy vote on interest in Irish reunification it's unlikely at this stage, I think, that any significant alterations regarding the protocol are likely to, to really drastically alter the course of politics is on here at the moment in Northern Ireland, largely because Brexit has already been acting as a, a successful catalyst in order to bring everything to this point in the first place. So while things are very challenging now at the moment in Northern Ireland, I think it's fair to say that they're only set to get a whole lot more complex and challenging in the months and years ahead and I will wrap up there. Thank you very much, Claire. The timing is amazing. You are really in uh, like 10 minutes uh, limit. Thank you very much for uh, managing so well this and for this um, uh, good overview of the situation. Pretty powerful images there with these graffitis that you showed. Uh, and um, now we can move to another area which uh, I think is boiling. I mean, in terms of political development, Scotland, is, 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 on, is on fire now and the elections will be, will be held in May and there is this infighting within the Scottish uh, National Party. So Danny, tell us more, please. Well, thank you so much, Sergio, Mark, Kanakira for the invitation. Uh, 
there are three main ideas that I wanted to share with you today. The first one is about Brexit and its impact on the accommodation of Scotland as a nation within the UK. The second one is about the election itself, as you were saying, on the 6th of May. And the third is about the prospects for a second independence referendum. So Brexit, election, independence are the three topics that I wanted to address. Mm -hmm. The first one, as I was saying, it's about Brexit. And my point is that Brexit has unsettled the accommodation of Scotland through a succession of grievances. So there was the referendum result to begin with, with Scotland voting by a majority of 62% remain in the UK, while England and the UK as a whole voted narrowly to leave. And this provided the material change of circumstances that according to the SNP would justify another referendum so soon after the one in 2014. And the result was also interpreted by the UK government as an act of self-determination in the words of Theresa May, which sits uneasily alongside the dominant idea of the UK in Scotland of the state as a plurinational union where national sovereignty is shared. And this initial grievance was reinforced then by the turn on the part of the UK government to a hard Brexit, excluding membership of the EU single market or the customs union, excluding or refusing to allow a differentiated Brexit for Scotland, which was the initial demand of the Scottish government in 2016. And then another grievance has been the Brexit process itself. It's been a recurrent complaint of the devolved government in Scotland and Wales, so not just pro-independence and also the Assembly in Northern Ireland, that they were not allowed to have a meaningful voice in the process. So intergovernmental relations have been ineffective. The Brexit bill was uh, rejected by the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly and the Northern Ireland Assembly. The Internal Market Bill recentralized some competences and revived the language of the UK as a unitary state. That was yet another grievance. And all this has been accompanied with the rise of what some term hyperunionism, this more assertive pro-union discourse by the UK government that has displaced more pragmatic, perhaps more subtle forms of unionism in the past, at least in Great Britain. And this is an important point because we know that majority self-perceptions in plurinational states are very important in shaping the dynamics of national disputes. And the UK's self-understanding seems to be moving towards a more unitary idea, one that looks less like, like unionism and sounds more like a form of state nationalism. Um, so here I've reached the, the end of my first point, the, the point about Brexit, the idea that Brexit hasn't settled the accommodation of Scotland. And it's not just about being taken outside the EU, it's about national grievances to be mobilized upon by Scottish nationalism. And it's about the erosion of unionism, of, of the purpose and the legitimacy of the union in, in Scotland. That was my first point. The second one is about the election on the 6th of May. So what do we know about the election? We know that the SNP is on course to win a majority of seats. They are projected to win some 52% of the votes and a pro-independence majority looks almost certain if we consider the Scottish Greens, which are the other pro-independence party enjoying parliamentary representation at Holyrood. We also know that independence is seen as the top issue, helping voters decide which party they'll vote for. As many as 44% of uh, Scots say that this will be the key issue when making a decision. And we also know that the SNP, as you were saying, Sergio, is divided. Because in, in Catalonia, we see mostly divisions between independence parties, as Marx and Jama was saying. In Scotland, there is one dominant pro-independence party that controls the timing of the independence demand comfortably and the strategy, but we're seeing increasingly uh, visible divisions within the party alongside many topics. Uh, the role of Joanna Cherry, for example, the critiques to the, the party's leadership, the issue of trans rights has become very important in the Scottish political agenda. Uh, the Scottish government's handling of the accusations against Alex Salmon, of course, are another critical issue. The party is becoming increasingly divided for the first time in 14 years and it's becoming more visible. The good news for the SNP is that they do not face a strong organized opposition able to make political gains out of the Salmon inquiry and the uh, divisions within the SNP because the Scottish Conservatives, which is the main opposition party in Scotland, are polling 30 points behind the SNP. 
and Scottish Labour have just elected their new party leader, Anna Sarwar, which is the fifth leader of the party in the last six years. The party undergoing significant crisis too in terms of their position, both on the national and the ideological uh, spectrum. So with this, I'm reaching the end of my second point about the elections. It's looking good for the SNP, but there are these considerations to keep in mind. And finally, the last point on, on the future, on, on independence, on the implications for a second independence referendum. Um, if pro-independence parties win a majority at the Scottish Parliament elections in May, then they will take this as a mandate for a second independence referendum. We know that. We also know that the UK government has stated that it will not permit it this time. We are heading towards a very Catalan scenario in which there is a mandate for a referendum, but the centre says no. So what happens then? How to exercise self-determination when the centre says no? Is that possible? Uh, where are we heading in the Scottish context? It's an open question. There is a lot of debate in Scotland at the moment about the process, whether the Scottish government may seek to hold a referendum using its executive powers under the Scotland Act or by way of legislation through the Scottish Parliament. If that happens, the matter is likely to come to the Supreme Court, which will assess whether the Scotland Act uh, 1998 allows for a consultative referendum. That's a legal debate, it's a, it's a complex one too, but perhaps more interesting is the political dimension of this and the SNP's leadership continues to advocate for a negotiated path out of this uh, situation. In the UK, unlike in Spain, there is, no constitution, there is no constitutional barrier to uh, secession. There is no constitutional right to secession. That's a similarity, but there's no constitutional barrier. And that's a difference. And in, unlike in Catalonia, there is a precedent to be of a negotiated referendum in 2014. And there is an understanding after all, at least to some degree of the UK as a voluntary union, even such proponents of the union like Margaret Thatcher in the past considered that Scotland is a self-determining nation. So perhaps, just perhaps, rather than extreme or unilateral measures, we may be heading towards a context in which the SNP tries to put or add pressure on the UK government and the, and, the, and the UK government has incentives to engage perhaps in a new vow or in a lock bomb in something that facilitates, improves, enhances the accommodation of Scotland uh, within the UK through perhaps uh, greater powers. It's an open question. And, and I look forward to discussing it with, with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, it was very interesting for me as well, um, this uh, comparative uh, dimension that you already brought in. You mentioned several times now the experience of, of, uh, of Catalonia and whether uh, SNP or the independentists in Scotland uh, learn something or are, are having this experience in mind when they, they designed their strategy. And then um, I'm also glad that um, we started with this kind of comparative approach because the first question uh, that I've seen here from Jaime goes into this direction. He, he mentioned Catalonia, he mentioned Catalonia and Scotland and um, uh, it's basically about the, the, the pro-independence parties. Uh, uh, well, in Catalonia, there are several parties not necessarily agreeing in all points. They only say, joint, I mean, ideal is the independence. Um, Jaime, uh, well, you mentioned that uh, in fact in Scotland, there's not only one um, uh, in the pro-independence party, also the Greens uh, in Scotland are pro-independence. So um, uh, I have to adapt a bit the question of Jaime because he, he made this uh, contrast between one party, pro-independence party in Scotland and um, more uh, in pro-independence parties in, in Catalonia. And the question is whether uh, there is some something there when it comes to to, um, the fact that there are more pro-independence parties in one uh, uh, region uh, uh, brings in a stronger, let's say, sub-state national movement. So fuels somehow, as far as I understand from his question, whether this fuels a bit uh, uh, more the, the pro-independence or the the, um, uh, the claims of, of, uh, of the legitimacy, legitimacy of the, of the pro-independence camp. So you can join one of you to both of you, of you, how you want. Mark, would you like to start? Yeah, well, that's that's a topic. Uh, that's a research topic in in the politics of self determination. In fact, um, there are arguments for and against uh, unity, uh, and there are also there are also some elements here that uh, are discussed 
in the literature. So uh, at first, uh, at first glance, so when you look at it first, you think, well, one in, having one independentist party is obviously it's obviously better. Uh, you have one strategy, and it, just in case there is a debate on the strategy, a strategic debate, and so on, this happens within the party, as it happened in the past uh, within the Parti Québécois in Quebec. Uh, and also happened within the SNP during the 80s and the 90s. On the other hand, I think that um, uh, we should distinguish between fragmentation, uh, disunity, and pluralism. In Catalonia, it it's almost impossible to imagine a situation in which there is uh, one united, uh, united uh, independence party nowadays. Uh, in the past, there was one united party uh, by the figure of uh, former president Jordi Pujol, which was an autonomous party and was, uh, let's say, from the center to the Christian Democrats, was aligned in this, in this broad ideological, ideological sense. But nowadays, I see the independentist movement very plural from the ideological perspective. And uh, I think that in some contexts, uh, uh, it, what helps to mobilize, and we have evidence on that in Catalonia, because in 2015 there was a there was a unitary uh, candidacy of independentist parties, and and what we have observed is that in fact uh, in order to uh, get to maximize support, it's better to have uh, different platforms with different ideological orientations. This is, this is, uh, is that weakening the movement? Well, it depends. It depends if, um, it depends on, on the content of the strategic plan. It depends on the hegemony on the, of this strategic plan. If uh, pluralism means fragmentation and different plans, then yes, that's obvious. And if pluralism means that then you have more supports and then you agree on a common, on a common strategy, then no, then you get more, more strength from that. So that's the, that's the difference. I think I think it depends on the context. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Jaime, for your question. And and if I may, uh, congratulations for your book, Visions of Sovereignty, which has been an inspiration for me and many other scholars uh, working in this field for for many years. Um. Just to try to add to what Mark was saying, I agree with many things. Uh, I don't see the presence of a plurality of pro-independence parties as necessarily fueling the pro-independence agenda. Uh, one of the lessons of the Catalan case actually is that it may hinder the success of the movement. Uh, we, if we try to learn from the lessons of October 2017, we see uh, probably that the dynamics of party competition between two parties of roughly the same size, which is the fundamental difference with Scotland where yes, there are two parties with parliamentary representation, but the SNP dominates comfortably the strategies and the timing. In Scotland, with, in Catalonia, with two parties of roughly the same size, what we saw is dynamics of party competition that led to an outcome that no one really desired, which was a declaration of independence that could not be implemented. Um, so uh, that would be my point. And this, the first point about uh, fueling uh, the agenda uh, it may be counterproductive. The second point I wanted to make is the, about the case of independence itself. Uh, given that in Catalonia there are parties, pro-independence parties that stem between, from the far left to the center right, that means that the case for independence inevitably is ideologically diverse. It comes from many ideological positions and it doesn't share necessarily a particular ideological standpoint which stands in clear contrast with both Flanders and Scotland for different reasons. In, in Scotland, fundamentally comes from the left and the idea that an independence comment would be uh, more progressive and it, it connects with the egalitarian myth of the Scottish nation, which is one of the foundation elements of Scottish nationalism. And, this, and in Flanders, it comes from the other side of the ideological spectrum. It comes from the right, given that the two main uh, sub-state nationalist parties, the two main Flemish parties place themselves on the right the case for at least further decentralization within Belgium uh, comes from this liberal conservative agenda. The fact that uh, in this consociational system, uh, the Flemish people desire certain policies 
that may not be achieved if it's not with further decentralization and further command of autonomy. So the case for independence itself uh, changes as well. We okay, thank you very much. And um, I would like to continue on this comparative, let's say, dimension. Uh, I, I was listening when I was you were speaking about the, the, the parties, you know, the party politics. I was wondering when, at least in the case of um, uh, of uh, post Brexit, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, uh, besides uh, uh, party pol the political dimension, there are at least two big factors that I think uh, plays play uh, and play them play, still play a role in, in these debates. Of course, Brexit is one, but then uh, also the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, responses. And um, I would like to ask to ask uh, Claire and, um, and uh, you, Daniel, uh, how you you would describe this, this uh, you know, the impact of these uh, responses you now, uh, do they uh, really have a weight in, in this uh, debates on, well, uh, independence of unification, how, how they, uh, they were uh, framed in, in terms of, of uh, responses. We did better here than, than London or than uh, UK government. Uh, so yes, please, I don't know, maybe, maybe Claire, you can start. Sure. Um, yeah, it's been one of the interesting dynamics here in Northern Ireland. Um, initially, things started well. Our political leaders uh, really took the bull by the horns and tried to, to steer the, the COVID management uh, agenda in terms of what's right for Northern Ireland. And then as time went on, we started gradually seeing then different policies were emerging in the Republic of Ireland compared to what was coming from Westminster. And inevitably, the politics of Northern Ireland became embroiled in that as well, because there was a certain fear that if the policy and the, the plans in Northern Ireland were seen to be aligning too closely to what was happening in the Republic of Ireland, then that would be almost um, an insult to what was going on in Westminster and, and vice versa. There was kind of a sense that Northern Ireland couldn't be seen to fully be doing either what was going on in the Republic of Ireland or in Westminster. And what we saw then was for quite a number of months, Northern Ireland was almost holding back on making decisions, waiting to see what the other two institutions would say before actually deciding, deciding itself what it was going to do. And there have been points where that has caused a lot of challenges. Um, for example, there were stages where the, the case numbers in the Republic of Ireland were significantly lower than in Northern Ireland. And there was a, a large argument going on at the time around, well, why don't we follow what's going on in the Republic of Ireland? It's one island, would be able to take an all-island approach, treat Ireland as one epidemiological unit um, in the same way that it's done for agriculture and, and just find a way through it on an all-island basis. But then the political dynamic of that is, well, we can't be seen to be doing that, especially from a unionist perspective, because then it seems as though there's a degree of alignment with what's happening in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and then there's been the flip side of that as well, where cases in Northern Ireland um, have been lower than in the Republic of Ireland. And then it's the same, the same dynamics, but with regard to Westminster. So it has really, um, it, it's been great frustration, I have to say, of people in Northern Ireland that th these dynamics have come to play because ostensibly, right from the outset, the, the interest in Northern Ireland has been, let's find a way through this, you know, let's, let's have a plan, tell us what we need to do and we'll run with it. But the political dynamics have had uh, delaying impacts in terms of the, the policy decisions that have been made around the management of COVID-19. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're in a good place, I think it's fair to say, in Northern Ireland in terms of the vaccine rollout. So arguably, that's a benefit, if I can put it that way, of the Brexit situation and that the UK has been able to go um, and source vaccines independently in the Republic of Ireland vaccine rollout hasn't been um, to quite the same level and that's to do, to do with the way the, the vaccines have been allocated throughout the member states within the European Union. So there have been, been pros and cons with, with the, the political dynamics here but I think fundamentally people are just sick to the back teeth of politics influencing something that, that doesn't know any political boundaries in the Northern Irish context. And in the Scottish case, I would perhaps argue that the COVID crisis has allowed the Scottish government to occupy the main political space. It has been the, it has taken the lead in responding to the crisis because public health is a devolved matter. And the daily briefings of Nicola Sturgeon have become you know, a symbol of a perceived display of competence, of political competence, 
which many in Scotland have contrasted with the confused messaging of some, Boris, some of Boris Johnson's remarks. This is despite the fact that the substantive policies that the Scottish government has adopted are not that different from those south of the border. And perhaps they cannot be because there is an open border between England and Scotland. If anything, the Scottish government has tended to be slightly more cautious uh, whenever possible, but the results and the measures themselves have not been fundamentally different. However, what has been fundamentally different has been the perception of competence among the Scottish electorate and the Scottish citizenship about uh, the two governments. So I would say that perhaps in many ways, um, the Sc Scottish politics have become even more detached from the British level, even more centered or around uh, the Scottish dimension. The, the UK government has been barely visible in this crisis up, uh, up until very recently. Uh, it's, it's relevant to collect taxes, it's relevant to distribute payments from uh, part of the welfare system. But, but there's an element here that has contributed to the projection of the Scottish nation as a viable, uh, efficient um, system of rule for, for the Scottish population. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Claire and Daniel. And and now I was uh, I would like to come back a, a bit to Catalonia. Um, I found very interesting uh, the was one of your slide mark where you uh, compared the the parliament also in terms of ideology uh, orientation. So you see that it's basically a left wing ideological um, majority there as well. Um, and now Spain has a socialist government. And um, I was wondering whether. What is your th what is your your thoughts about this? Whether the socialist government um, having this no ideological, let's say, friendlier uh, pro-independence parties in Catalonia would be more open towards the idea of uh, negotiating a kind of federal arrangement? What do you think? Yeah, th there was a lot of speculation on that. Uh, as you have seen in this slide, uh, there are several. In theory, there are several possible majorities in the Catalan Parliament. Uh, if we align the parties uh, through the uh, using the national axis, uh, then we see that there is this uh, pro-independence majority and uh, and, and pro-unity opposition. But as you said, uh, if we do the same exercise in the left-right axis, then we could have a leftist majority. The thing is, um, um, there are two. There are two elements here. The first is that um, some people said that there could be a multi-level game. So ERC, this leftist pro-independence party, was supporting Pedro Sánchez in Madrid. And then uh, this same party could do, uh, could do the reverse operation in Catalonia. So the ERC being uh, in the presidency, supported by the Socialist Party in Catalonia in a multi-level multi exchange of supports. Uh, the thing is that the, these two blocs, the pro-union, pro-unionist and the pro-independence blocs, nowadays are still, are still very far away each other. Um, just, our audience probably, you know a lot about, about Catalonia and, and the Socialist Party has been now in government for three years. And this law and order approach to the self-determination each issue remains in place. So the counter secessionist strategy of the Spanish authorities remains the same. There are still many judiciary processes and many prosecutions going on. And there are still trials coming uh, this year of people who was in, were involved because of their of their positions in the uh, 2017 referendum. And the Socialist Party some, promised when Pedro Sánchez was elected, the Socialist Party promised that this law and order approach would, uh, would change and there would be a more flexible approach to the self-determination issue. But we are in 2021 and, and we don't see this change of uh, approach. So uh, for, for, for ERC and for, for the leftist pro-independence party, it was very difficult. It was very difficult to explain to the electorate that they were going to uh, reach an agreement with the Socialist Party. Um, it's almost impossible. So they, they, they are very close or they are closer in terms of ideology they are both leftist parties, but uh, because of this cleavage, because of the repression from the state, 
uh, because of the uh, well, this this uh, emotional uh, polarization and political polarization created by the judiciary branch, uh, it's impossible. It's impossible to reach this agreement nowadays. Uh, and during the campaign, this was an issue, and 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 there was a, a sort of a sort of competition within the pro-independence parties, and they ended up signing a document that they would not reach an agreement with the Socialist Party because of the repression strategy uh, uh, from Madrid. So um, that, that's the situation. I imagine, I imagine, I think that on specific topics, on the budget law, on, on, on specific public policies, there will be agreements, uh, uh, cross blocks agreements. But on the general issue of forming a government, uh, electing the ministers and so on, uh, it, it's impossible to reach an agreement nowadays. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I was uh, trying to follow also the the chat to to um, uh, select new question. I've seen. I think it's very interesting that there were at least two uh, question comments uh, regarding other. Um, um, cases of, uh, well, if we can call them downgraded autonomies or former autonomies. Uh, uh, I mean, there was a question about Tatarstan and another one about Hong Kong. And um, about, uh, I mean, of course, it's a different situation. The question whether there are some comparison between this these two cases and uh, the three cases that we discussed today. Uh, obviously, uh, a totalitarian regime uh, or the, the tot regime that dismantles autonomy, I think we will uh, not be able to, to, to try to, I mean, we'll not be able to find too many uh, parallels between these cases and uh, um, and what we discussed today, probably accept a bit the, the violence, you know, the, the law, law and order kind of approach, strong law and order approach uh, that we've, we have seen in, in Catalonia. Um, and uh, I mean, I would like to, to link this uh, uh, with a question for Claire. Um, I, I come back to the, um, this um, picture, the graffiti that you mentioned, that you showed us earlier. Uh, we know very well how sensitive uh, the situation is in Northern Ireland. And um, I mean, it's, it's very worrying the impact on the Good Friday Agreement what will happen next and so on. And the question is, uh, uh, do you think that the peace and stability uh, is at risk, can be a risk as a result of the of the Brexit? Uh, uh, it's still a kind of fluid ongoing uh, situation, but uh, what do you think about this? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, and I think it's something that has been projected and spoken about from right even before the referendum was held. Um, the fact that Brexit isn't just a question about the European Union, it's something that speaks fundamentally to the division in Northern Ireland, to the two communities, to the very basis of what the division in Northern Ireland has historically been about, means that Brexit fundamentally, it, it, it hits a lot deeper than, than simply just being a question about European Union membership in that way. And the fact that it, it really enforced a binary position onto people in Northern Ireland again, in a way that certainly in my lifetime hasn't been seen. And without giving away my age, I'm not too much older than the Good Friday Agreement itself. So um, it's it really was a fundamental shake of people in Northern Ireland at a stage where people had been starting to think about um, politics and think about society as something that was beyond the, the, the unionist and nationalist binary suddenly people were being forced again to think in terms of, well, it's one or the other and you need to make a decision on it. Um, and really it is, it's, it's acted as such a strong catalyst to, to encourage people to start thinking in those binary terms again. Um, I'm not going to go as far necessarily as saying that it has set Northern Ireland back in terms of its progress. I think what it has actually done has, has prompted a conversation that maybe wasn't possible, I think, to have maybe 10, 15 years ago. It's it's a much more mature conversation that's going on at the moment, but the ructions that it is causing are no less severe and no less uh, no less difficult for Northern Ireland to try and navigate because fundamentally the politics in Northern Ireland, the, the design of the, the political institutions that we have here, they're built on, on the model of consociationalism and always the elections will, will ultimately end up centering around the, the unionist and nationalist parties. But as I highlighted, um, to, to uh, started to highlight it within my presentation, the, the rise of the centre ground in relation to other elections that have happened in Northern Ireland over the last couple of years would suggest that in theory, you should start to see the centre ground starting to, to come forward in politics in Northern Ireland. Now, there are some um, 
uh, number crunchers and and uh, uh, people who work with um, work the statistics and the figures around elections here in Northern Ireland, and they are starting to suggest that possibly what we might see in the next election is for the first time that there won't be a unionist first minister coming forward. So. Uh, to, to give a little bit of context, we have a joint uh, first and deputy first minister in the Northern Ireland arrangements. One comes from the largest unionist party, one from the largest nationalist party. And to date, there hasn't been a first minister that has come from a nationalist party. That's something that's looking that might be quite likely at the next election. And that's coming on top of all of the, the, the points that I ra raised through my presentation that basically are, are highlighting that this is an extremely difficult time for unionism as an idea, as a concept, and for, and for the community more generally in Northern Ireland here. Um, so all of those things coming together, all of those various strands of, um, of, of different ways of thinking, different approaches towards Brexit, and the, the very real consequences, and the, we see that every day here in Northern Ireland in terms of, especially in, in January, in terms of empty shelves and supermarkets, for example, Things that we took for granted in terms of movement of goods from uh, movement of goods from Great Britain into Northern Ireland, it's a very real um, marker and a way of actually visibly seeing how the protocol is operating and that it is in fact putting a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. All of these these different elements coming together really do destabilise the situation in Northern Ireland, um, not only in terms of the conversations that are being had, albeit I think that it's Northern Ireland's in a much better place now for having those conversations, but at the political level as well, it just pushes the chasm between the, the extremes of the political spectrum, particularly the DUP and Sinn Féin, even further apart. Um, and we're seeing just one example that I'll, I'll close on in the last few weeks that um, there's an umbrella organization called the Loyalist Communities Council, um, which is an organization which comprises of several different um, essentially paramilitary organizations on the loyalist side of things here in Northern Ireland. They've been quite vocal in recent months anyway within media circles trying to project the, the unionist and loyalist perspectives on what's happening. But they issued a letter to the Prime Minister within the last couple of weeks uh, saying that they were revoking support for the Good Friday Agreement. Now, you might think, what platform do these individuals have to speak on? Their illegitimate bodies contained within this, I, I should emphasize, fully legal um, communities council body itself, a, a, a different matter for all of the, the bodies contained within it. But at the same time, it really goes to show that if people are talking in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, not having the support there that had been there prior to Brexit, albeit there's a whole other story about the road to getting to that stage of having the support, then that really does put a huge question mark over what's to come in the future and what's going to happen next. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm flow following also the the question, the chat question, and uh, I'm really glad that there are so many. Unfortunately, I will have to to be selective and pick up one here and there. Uh, I apologize for not being able to, to um, answer or to, to ask the, the speakers all of your questions. I um, now would like to go back to Scotland. I think um, uh, this is very interesting. I mean, it is clear that uh, if uh, Boris Johnson government refuses to, to, to accept and you know, to grant the um, section 30 so called uh, referendum, um, there is um, uh, then uh, basically a case of constitutional collision between the two two governments, and I was wondering uh, whether there is a, this public debate uh, regarding the options that the uh, Scottish government will have in such situation. Um, again, we come back to basically the the point you mentioned: whether they they learn some lesson from the Catalan experience, uh, whether they, they understand that uh, this might be not be, the, the outcome might not be the desired one, or whether they they will uh, think about a court challenge that to, to basically have the judges decide whether the referendum will take place or not. Daniel? Yeah, thank you, Sergio. Um, the SNP and the Scottish government have been following very closely the Catalan developments over the past few years, and they are conscious of the lessons that need to be learned in terms of the inconvenience of the unilateral agenda. But perhaps the broader question is, how do you exercise self-determination when the center says no in advanced democracies? Because if you do nothing, 
then and you are a pro-independence party in power, obviously you are not doing what your voters ask you to do. Uh, if you pursue unilateral measures, such as a unilateral referendum, for example, that is subject to boycott by internal unionists who will not turn up to vote because that will delegitimize the vote. And you will also lose the support as an independence movement of soft sovereignists who agree in principle with the idea of self-determination but are not in favor of unilateral measures. We also know from the Catalan experience that interna international campaigns uh, to achieve further recognition, understanding, perhaps achieve international media mediation are of limited use. They, they, are, they very rarely work and it's very difficult to navigate a world of states in which there is a shared interest in state integrity. Um, so it's not easy to navigate these situations. The legal path may be an option, but one of the inconveniences I think may have for both sides is that it reduces a very complex political issue, which in the UK, unlike in Spain, takes the form of a up until now political debate to a legal uh, solution, the outcome of which is not entirely clear. It's not clear to me why the two sides would see a benefit in reducing the possibilities of demanding, for example, a second referendum in the future to the decision of the Supreme Court on this matter, because in a way it undermines the fundamental claim or the premise of the debate, which is that there is a political issue that needs to be solved between two governments in a context in which there is no constitutional barrier to secession, but no constitutional right to secession either. And so it, it highlights this dimension. So I think from the Scottish case, we may, we may be able to draw these broad lessons about the difficulties of sub-state national movements to exercise self-determination when the center says no. And just to conclude, I think it highlights the idea that the Scottish, sorry, the Edinburgh Agreement in 2012 was unusual, was extraordinary. It's, it's, it's uncommon to have negotiated referendums. We've seen uh, state opposed referendums as in Catalonia in 2017. We've seen state tolerated referendums as in Quebec in 1995. But, but state negotiated referendums in this kind of uh, liberal democracies are very uncommon. Uh, and so apart from that precedent, we may face now all these debates about how to navigate this complex structure of incentives for both sides. Uh, thank you. This brings me to um, a question um, uh, that uh, was posted in the chat. Uh, and I also very much like the fact that participants are not only lawyers and political scientists, but uh, no, just uh, you know, uh, uh, persons interested in, in these uh, no, events that are, are developing around us. And the question was um, about the role of the EU and why the EU does not take a clear or uh, a st stand regarding, for example, this this um, uh, pro-independence movements, and um, it was clearly in the case of Catalonia. Now, I mean, the Catalan independentists uh, were managed, I think, to to win the public opinion across Europe, especially after the violent scenes uh, we've seen uh, uh, in Barcelona or yeah, across the region. Uh, but they were not able to um, basically win support from the EU member states or the EU itself. I mean, obviously, EU is uh, is this famous saying that uh, you know, uh, international community is not a suicide club. So uh, there are states, national states' interests there, and of course you will probably I mean, definitely will never support uh, uh, such uh, independentist movements within the member states as well. Um, I think we still have um, very few minutes, maybe, yeah, well, two, three minutes. And uh, I would like to give you the floor for like you no know, final few words, one, two minutes each uh, about the, you no know, the potential, let's say, uh, developments or, or yeah, just your final thoughts about the, the, the discussion we had today. And I uh, will start maybe with uh, Mark. Yeah, well, just a final comment on, on the future on future scenarios. So many people say that Catalonia is somehow stuck in a, in a dead end after the, the 2017 events. I think that we can take a more optimistic uh, point of view, as I have shown in my in my presentation. Uh, there are there are many possible majorities in the Catalan Parliament. There are changes in terms of leadership, and there is also uh, an avenue to explore uh, in this possible agreement or or negotiation uh, between the central government and the Catalan institutions on 
self-government. There are many examples. Uh, Danny said that, that, that the Scottish referendum was, uh, was an exception. I agree on that. But uh, in, in terms, in, in broader terms, in terms of self-government uh, and federalism and, and agreements, uh, territorial agreements, as you show in your project, there are many examples across the world to, to inspire potential solutions both on uh, self-determination and self-government. And I think that, uh, that uh, Spain and Catalonia will be able to find, will be able to find one of these, uh, its own solution to this uh, political conflict that nowadays remains, remains uh, unsolved, unfortunately. Um, Claire? Thank you. Um, my concluding thoughts, I'm going to, to draw upon um, some of Daniel's final comments there um, and outline a couple of comparisons, I think, between Northern Ireland and Scotland, given that they're, they're both within uh, the wider structure of the United Kingdom. Um, the first one I will pick up on uh, directly from Daniel in, in speaking about the, um, the, the formal processes. Um, I paraphrase heavily around how um, uh, an independence referendum can be sought. Um, and I think one point to highlight there is that while Scotland uh, doesn't have that route lined out, Northern Ireland does through the Good Friday Agreement, there is a process outlined in terms of how um, a border poll stroke unity referendum uh, can be achieved and attained in Northern Ireland. So um, that's something that is, is receiving a lot of attention recently. In fact, there's been a court case that has come forward um, and that is going to appeal actually around the, the processes for that and the circumstances under which as the Secretary of State will be um, required to, to call a border poll in Northern Ireland. And that's feeding into that wider conversation and discourse around Irish reunification in the context of Northern Ireland at the moment. The second point that I'll add is that something that is, is often overlooked in the Northern Irish case is that in, co in contrast to Scotland, Scotland's case is one where it's a choice between remaining part of the United Kingdom or being independent. That, that question of independence isn't one that is in the conversation for Northern Ireland. It's a choice of being part of one state or the other. And that makes it a very different conversation. It's a very different uh, political game that comes in, into play with that. It's very different political dynamics. And in that sense, even despite being part of the United Kingdom, that conversation around what independence is, how it should look like, what referendums should look like in terms of that wider question about the integrity of the United Kingdom as a single entity, that, that differs across the different areas of the United Kingdom. Um, so yeah, just to re-emphasize that Northern Ireland in its own way is, is a place apart, if I can put it that way, but in being a place apart, it's 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 in many different places at the one time. Um, so I think uh, probably the elections going forward will be the, the main aspects to watch in Northern Ireland. And of course, the the, the drama around the, the protocol, particularly what's happening between the EU and the UK within the Joint Committee will be something really worth keeping an eye on in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Um, I suppose I would conclude by stressing that the UK constitutional or, or territorial uh, design continues to be in crisis, that there's a crisis about the internal management of national diversity within the UK, and that the May Scottish election may or will probably result in another peak in this plurinational contestation that we've seen in the UK over the past few years. I would also stress that independence is not inevitable. Support for independence in Scotland, while very high in comparative perspective, is now at 52%. It has fallen four points in the last Ipsos Morius poll, which contrasts sometimes with what political commentators, usually based in London, say about the Scottish situation. There seems to be the assumption sometimes that Scotland is already lost for the union. And that's clearly not the case to me. Uh, I can see support for independence uh, reverting also to uh, lower figures. Uh, so there's nothing inevitable about independence, although that's a very, it's a very serious uh, challenge for the union. And maybe stress also to conclude that Brexit has a paradoxical effect that as I was trying to point out earlier on, it creates a succession of grievances that fosters the case for independence, but at the same time, it makes independence itself more difficult uh, because it politicizes the border with England insofar as there would be a border between an EU member, if an independence column would be in the EU and outside, there would be a need for coordination and regulation in the border and so on and so on. The interdependent vision of independence set out in the white paper in 2013 is no longer plausible. So that creates all sorts of issues. 
And uh, finally, that the election may result in, in further complexity, messiness, tensions, and possibly a deadlock. It may very well be, we know from the Catherine experience that these situations may sometimes result in a continued deadlock over time. All right, thank you very much um, to all of you to, uh, for, for giving us uh, this uh, very interesting insights and also your, your thoughts about potential developments. I'm, I'm sure that we'll, uh, we'll have the chance to, to discuss uh, more on these issues. As I said, this is some kind of con ongoing process and uh, as this is a, a series of webinars, we will uh, we'll continue uh, with um, uh, such topics. Um, I know that uh, Nakira, my colleague already posted in the Q&A uh, chat uh, some additional information about uh, the center for autonomy experience and about the uh, autonomy um, arrangements in the world project so if you are interested in staying in touch with us following what we are doing you find the information there i would like to thank a lot to the participants um, uh, there was a very active uh, participation uh, many questions very interesting questions as unfortunately due to time limitation i had to select uh, only uh, a small amount of these questions uh, would have been possible probably to go on for another two three hours to to discuss these issues and um, yes, I would like in the end also to, to have thank my, my colleagues, Anakira and Ivan, who made possible uh, from uh, you know, the technical point of view, uh, this, this meeting. And uh, I wish everybody a good evening and uh, see you next time. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.